for a conversation about personalizing cancer care, please welcome Vincent Miller, Chief Medical Officer of Foundation Medicine, Julie Fleshman, the President and CEO of Pancreatic Cancer Action Network, and Nikhil Waggle, a medical oncologist at the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute. Please, back to lead the discussion, WebMD's Michael Smith. Thank you, everyone. I'm going to leave a lot of time for questions because I suspect in this seemingly booming area of cancer medicine, there will be a lot, but I, you know, let's just get to it. Nick, tell us about the reality of personalized medicine versus the hype. Really, where are we today? Yeah, sure. Uh, thanks for having us. Um, I think that's a great place to start because we talk a lot about personalized medicine or precision medicine, precision cancer medicine. And what we mean by that, and we've talked about it a lot already today, is the idea that we can look at a patient's tumor sample, we can identify something about the genomic or molecular underpinnings of that tumor, and then use that information to pick an appropriate therapy that will have a, a great response. And the, the goal is to really, in every patient's tumor, be able to find that Achilles heel uh, and have a treatment that targets that Achilles heel and lead to these Lazarus-like effects that we heard about earlier today. And I think, and, and there are lots of examples like that, there are an in increasing number of cancer types or cancer subtypes where we have a Achilles heel that we can discover and we have a great drug and we can pair those together. But there's still a lot of cancers where we either don't understand how that works or we don't understand the biology or we don't have an appropriate drug. And I think where the reality is right now is that this is clearly a promising approach that's had a huge impact for many, many patients and many, many cancer types, uh, but we can't yet say that precision medicine is the way to treat all cancers and that, um, that this is the way we should be approaching every patient's cancer. It's, it's, it's great for many people in whom we have that kind of evidence, and then for many other people, we still have to rely on clinical trials or the development of large data sets to be able to find how we can use precision medicine in more people. And Julie, with you, with your focus on pancreatic cancer, where do you see that we are currently and even the future of personalized or precision medicine? So I got involved in this space um, because my father was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer 19 years ago. He was 52 years old and died four months later, and we were basically told there were no options for him. And so I've watched the pancreatic cancer scientific community evolve over the last 18 years because of advocacy, because of more funding, um, and we are making progress and we understand much more about the disease, um, but we still don't understand how best to treat pancreatic cancer patients, um, and certainly personalized medicine um, is one option that we need to look at. We need to further understand it. I think we need to make sure that we're learning from every single patient. Um, the Pancreatic Cancer Action Network published a paper looking historically at the last 30 years at the pancreatic cancer landscape. And unfortunately, the majority of the phase three trials failed. But there were patients on those trials that did well, that were the long tail on the curve, but we don't know why. And so we need to do much better in understanding and learning from every single patient so that we can make advancements in treatment. And I think this is such an important topic, Vince, so I want to hear from you too. From your unique perspective with Foundation Medicine, your, your recent approval, if you could speak to that too. But where do you see today that we are with personalized medicine? So I, I think it's important to set the table. The backdrop is that for many patients with advanced cancer, the options are really they're not good, right? It's usually, a, for the overwhelming majority, it's an incurable entity treated with toxic medicines. That's really different than coronary artery disease, COPD, dyslipidemia, and therefore, the measurements, uh, the types of studies we do, when we pay for something, that scale needs to be uh, set differently. And I think the FDA has been great about recognizing that in their approval process. Um, furthermore, if you, you know, there are a number of studies that have looked at what is a patient's understanding of the therapy their doctor is going to administer, and in that exact situation I described, oftentimes the patient, for whatever reason, has a perception that, that they can be cured or they're likely to be cured, and unfortunately, of course, that's not the case. 
So one needs to take that backdrop as we assess what precision medicine, which we've talked about and we focused on from the genomic end, but it could be from anything. It could be from the imaging end. It could be from the, uh, it could be from the germline end and, and uh, immuno-oncology end, and it's likely an integration of these, of course. So I think the field is multidimensional. Genomics is where we chose to start. We thought that was the greatest single bang for the buck at foundation medicine uh, by taking this uh, agnostic view of the cancer genome and trying to learn as much as we could about it. But that's not where any of us need to stop. And there are a number of needs of this community that I think we're going to, you know, address more broadly in, in future, you know, questions and conversations. Yeah. And so let's dig into this hype reality just a little bit more. Now, Nick, I know you recently commented, I think, to Liz Jabo's piece from Kaiser Health News about if we're actually being misled by precision medicine, are we? Yeah, I, I think it depends um, who you talk to and what, what, the, what the message is. I think in Liz's piece in the New York Times, she, um, I think, very aptly brought up the story of, stories of patients who, um, who try to um, use a precision medicine approach. There's some biomarker in their tumor that suggests a particular drug might work, and then that drug doesn't work. Uh, and I think it's important to remember that other side of it. We, we often talk about the patients who have, uh, who, in whom we find something, we pick a drug, and they have these great responses, and their tumors are cured, or they, or they um, are treated with those drugs for a long time. And, and that is so important, both because of the hope it provides patients and because of the progress it means that we are making. But we also have to remember that that story is not true for every patient with cancer. And in Liz's piece, she talks about um, that this hype, we have to remember that there are patients in whom we still need to understand either why they didn't have the same great response as someone who we thought looked just like them, or um, why the, in their cancer type, a drug that works really well in a different cancer type doesn't work. And there are a lot of nuances, as to Vince's point. We, we start with a certain level of information that we learn about tumor types, but there are so many additional levels and, and pieces of data that we need, to, we need to fit in there to be able to understand for every individual patient, how do we get every person to have a great response? Mm -hmm. And I think um, if, we, if we make the claim that every patient is gonna have a great response if we simply sequence their tumor and then choose the drug that that sequencing says, we are, um, we're overhyping things and, and there's a lot to learn still. And so let's dig into a specific use or the attempt to use specific use with um, PanCan's initiative with Know Your Tumor Precision. Tell us a little bit about what those are and like how you would actually see that you know, implemented in reality. Yep. So about four years ago, um, we launched a program called Know Your Tumor. Um, at the time, there was really no information or data to say whether, you know, precision medicine would work in pancreatic cancer, and there was actually a lot of controversy around us launching this program. Um, we have a call center, and we get a high volume of contacts into the call center, so we had the platform to be able to talk to patients um, and find out if they wanted to get their tumors molecularly profiled. And we partnered with a third-party vendor. If the patient was interested, we handed them off to the third-party vendor who then worked with the treating physician to get the tissue sample, get the testing, which is currently being done at Foundation Medicine, um, and get those results back with a report that also included recommend, recommended treatment options for that patient, and that would go back then to the treating physician and to the patient, and we would follow up to make sure that both the patient and the healthcare professional understood that report. Mm -hmm. And so to date, we have actually enrolled over 1,800 patients mm -hmm. in that program. We have 1,000, over 1,000 final reports that were you know, provided back to the patient um, and to the healthcare professional, and recently published that for those patients that have a highly actionable alteration, and about 25% of pancreatic cancer patients have a highly actionable alteration, and those patients go on a matched or targeted therapy, their outcomes are better. Cool. And so to that point, you mentioned Foundation Medicine. Tell us, um, Vince, a little bit about, you know, what the recent FDA approval was, but specifically, how does that affect coverage and access? Yeah, so um, the genesis of seeking the, the parallel review FDA approval and CMS coverage was really that in working with third-party payers, of course, they're incredibly different, but one thing 
unfortunately was somewhat in common, whatever one might come in with as far as data seemed in general to get, you know, kick the can down the road. And so this gave us a uh, unambiguous path, albeit a tough one to approval. Um, and it was important also though personally because the stakes are so much higher now that um, with, some, with some therapies and some biomarkers, if you have that biomarker and you get that therapy, you have a really, really high chance of responding. And if you don't have that biomarker and get that therapy, you might have a negligible or no chance of responding. So while we all are fallible, we had to have the highest fidelity and confidence in our results, particularly when the things we're talking about are 1%, 0.5%, 0.8%, 0 0.8%, very easy to put the scientific community, pharma community, et cetera, down a rabbit hole. So you got to be right and control as much noise in the system as you can. So the parallel review process, the FDA approval, and the CMS uh, coverage policy for Medicare beneficiaries opened the door for coverage for patients with advanced cancer uh, for that, for that uh, group and for Medicare Advantage uh, beneficiaries. But it still doesn't address one of the biggest barriers to access this precision medicine approach, which is doctor and patient amidst all the stress and challenges of their disease in their lives, being comfortable that the patient's not gonna be encumbered with some huge bill uh, amidst everything else they're facing. And then, so Nick, I wanna definitely touch on your Count Me In project because it really speaks to a challenge that we've talked a lot about today already with clinical trials. Tell us what that is and really how it helps us forward that. Sure, thanks, thanks for that question. Uh, Count Me In is a new nonprofit organization that we launched uh, several weeks ago now that really seeks to empower patients with cancer um, to share their information, share their medical information, their tumor samples, their saliva samples, in order to generate this large clinical genomic database, which is then shared publicly with the entire research community to be able to accelerate mm -hmm. precision medicine and the development of new treatments and treatment strategies. And it's really, to Julie's point, it's the idea of learning from every patient. So right now, a very small fraction of cancer patients go to these large comprehensive cancer centers where their tumor samples are studied and um, lead to discoveries. The vast majority of cancer patients are treated in community centers or in smaller hospitals around the country, and their tumor samples are sitting on shelves in pathology departments, and their medical records are being used to take care of them but aren't being used to put together this large database um, it, that we might learn and find the people who respond to certain therapies. And so the idea behind Count Me In was to really allow all of those patients that aren't already part of big research studies to be able to contribute their samples as well. And so we've launched now projects in four major cancers. We've launched projects in metastatic breast cancer, in metastatic prostate cancer, in angiosarcoma, a rare sarcoma, and stomach and esophageal cancer. And our goal over the next um, few years is to launch projects in every major cancer type as well as rare and pediatric cancers. And this is an organization, it's nonprofit, all the data is shared publicly as it's generated and it's, a, it's an initiative um, of the Broad Institute, the Emerson Collective, the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute and the Biden Cancer Initiative. And I think it will hopefully generate large data sets that can help us figure out who, who should get which therapies and, and really enable precision medicine for many more patients than are currently benefiting from it. And that was going to be my question. We're, we're bringing in a lot of data, but then how do we, for those patients, actually use it to produce you know, potential treatment or you know, even a cure for those people? Yeah, so that's a great question. So right now, in Count Me In, it is largely patients donating their information and donating their samples and their, and their genetic information to this database so that we can learn. Because I think learning is, is the first major step. We need, to, we need to find patterns in the data. We need to figure out which patients with pancreatic cancer are gonna respond to which therapies and which patients are gonna benefit from immunotherapy. Once we learn that information, we need to be able to then tell those patients, well, you have a, this particular biomarker or you would benefit from this clinical trial or you would benefit from this approved drug. And so this network that, that we're trying to create our hope is that over time this becomes a bi-directional network that not only are we learning from patients, but we're also then able to give them information back about what, what their best therapy is. You know, and we've talked a lot about access, access to cancer treatment, access to clinical trials, but I mean, access to personalized and precision medicine is going to be pretty unique. So Julie, tell us a little bit about like, how do you think we can actually tackle that? So 
our program, Know Your Tumor, um, one of, I think, the unique um, aspects of it is that it's available to any patient anywhere. So we're not partnering with a particular institution to collect this information, but it's patient really driven that no matter where the patient is, we will provide, you know, we will give them access to that testing and they will get their report. So I think that's one example of a way to um, democratize this, if you will. Um, but that will certainly um, continue to be a challenge that we all have to work together to make sure that no matter where a patient is, because the majority of the patients are seen in community settings, that they are be being given the opportunity to have this testing and to understand what the best treatment is for them. And because I was going to give a lot of time for questions, I'm going to be coming to the audience shortly, but I have kind of a biggie last question. What next? Like, where do you see us going, Vince, with precision and personalized medicine? What's kind of the next big exciting thing from your perspective? Well, I, I do think um, that the field is young and that there are many dimensions to it, as we've, as we've talked about. It's not just geno genomics and other technologies that you'll hear about or may have heard about. Uh, I think, and, and what I'm looking for, and of course, when we work with institutions or other companies or even ourselves, we're always so paranoid about who owns the data and data rights and things. I'm really excited to start to see some of the very first meaningful and uh, unexpected observations from these large data sets that affect how we treat some subset of cancer patients. That patients who have mutation A and mutation B uh, uniquely respond to a drug that doesn't overtly target either of those, but the mechanism becomes elucidated, for example, through these data sets, something like that. And because that's the type of uh, quantum leap we're going to need to make as we unravel these more complex tumors that aren't the edge of the curve and are more sensitive uh, and, and the linkage is more apparent to particular therapeutics. But I think certainly everyone probably here has little doubt that this is a key uh, and essential foray to make the meaningful progress we all want. I was going to say, and I think the other aspect of this is, you know, it really requires a different clinical trial model to be able to test yeah. smaller subgroups of patients um, and get to answers um, so that we can get drugs approved. And so I think that's the other aspect of this. I know in pancreatic cancer, if you talk to researchers, they say it's probably going to be a combination of targeted therapy and immunotherapy and this and that. And so how do we do combinations like that and test them in a rapid fashion um, that doesn't take years and years and years to make progress? Wonderful. Great. Um, is there... Can't... Go ahead. Hi, uh, my name is Jay Erickson. I'm uh, the health and wellness lead at a company called Modus. I'm also a cancer survivor. Oh, okay. uh, I'm a straight, straight But guy. where are you? Okay, okay, right there. Uh, I'm also <laughs> a, a subject in a genomic study um, at Sloan Kettering. My question is, um, uh, I recently did the Ancestry.com uh, thing, and, you know, is there any potential or how, how what's being examined in taking those massive data sets between 23andMe and Ancestry? And I understand they're, they're the unmutated genomes, but how can that data be used to brought into the matrix either longitudinally with claims or against other data to look for patterns either for therapies or, or potential side effects of therapies. Yeah, I mean, genetic testing, great discussion in and of its own. Nick, you want to weigh in on that? Sure. I, I think that's a great question. And, and the, the, the broader question is we, there are all these existing databases, commercial or academic, um, that are often sitting and they're not connected. And can we somehow connect all these databases and learn from them in aggregate because there's certainly power in numbers. Um, there is an effort called DNA Land um, for, for, that allows patients to upload their information that they may have received from Ancestry.com or from 23andMe to a, a much larger database that then reanalyzes and re-aggregates all that data. But as you said, that's about germline information. One of the biggest things I think that is missing from a lot of these databases is that they may have one layer of information. So they may have your germline information, but they don't know your cancer history necessarily, or they don't know what treatments you got and what worked and what didn't, or your side effects. And I think the next frontier in thinking about these large data sets is making sure that we have integrated germline information, tumor genomic and molecular information, clinical information about the patient, treatment information, maybe radiology. Um, most of the time, those databases, if they do exist, are separate and not linked. And when those databases can be linked, we can start to learn from those patterns and say, patients with these 
germline biomarkers might be more likely to have these side effects from these drugs and, and learn in that way. Hi, um, Evan Shore. I um, was wondering, you mentioned the uh, uh, clinical trial process would have to be completely revamped. Can you go into a little more detail about what that would look like? So I can talk about what we are working on. Um, so PANCAN is in the process of putting together an adaptive clinical trial platform for pancreatic cancer that would allow multiple arms to all be studied um, at the same time. Um, and if something isn't working, it comes off and something new goes on. Um, initially, patients will be randomized and we won't be using um, uh, molecular profiling to put patients onto the right arm, but the hope would be that as we learn, we would eventually be able to do that. Just it, you know, there have been, there are, this is underway. So you hear about initiatives like NCI Match or the ASCO Taper study. Um, or a lung map, and, and each of those might get critiqued just as precision medicine in the whole is called under question, but they all are directionally, in my belief, where we want to go. Greater recasting the perception around therapeutic trials, uh, that many good agents are out there, particularly if a target or a putative target might be present, uh, particularly when contrasted with the standard therapy, uh, and that uh, the availability and breadth of access needs to be out in that 80% of patients who are in the community and not just at centers of excellence. And, and this is particularly important because, as been said, you know, there are these groups of patients who are 1% or 0.5% that may have a particular Achilles heel that the clinical trial will benefit. And if um, in, in trials that look at all comers, as, as Julie was saying, right, most the trial fails, there's that small group of people that benefit, and at any one center or even a few large centers, you may not ever find enough patients that fall into that responding group, and that's why these large distributed networks or the ability to engage patients who are treated in the community for clinical trials will be really important going forwards. I think the role of nonprofits and philanthropy are really critical as we talk about these things because these big multi-institutional, you know, large-scale data sets and learning from every patient requires dollars. Mm -hmm. um, and I know our, we're really investing in this precision, I mean, in this uh, precision promise platform, adaptive clinical trial platform, um, and we're providing dollars mm -hmm. to it to make it possible. Well, thank you. I think we could probably have a full day summit on this one topic. So I really appreciate you guys sharing your perspectives. Thank you very much. Thank you.